You're listening to Voices of Customer Experience. I'm your host, Mary Drummond, and on this podcast, we shine the spotlight on individuals who are making a difference in customer experience. We also proudly bring you the very best of customer experience, behavior economics, data analytics, and design. Make sure to subscribe or follow us on social for updates. Voices of Customer Experience is brought to you by Worthix. Discover your worth at worthix.com. Tom Goodwin is the EVP and Head of Innovation at Zenith Media. His role is to understand new technology, behaviors, and platforms, and ideate and implement solutions for clients. An industry provocateur and commentator, he's regularly contributed on The Guardian, Inc., GQ, TechCrunch, Forbes, AdAge, AdWeek, and Digiday, and his work has been featured in the New York Times, The Economist, and The Times. Voted number one voice in marketing by LinkedIn and one of the 30 people to follow on Twitter by Business Insider, here's Tom Goodwin. Hello, thanks for having me on the show. And joining us once again is my co-host, James Conrad. Thanks for coming on, James. Hey, Mary, great to be here. Thanks for being here today. So as as a starter to begin, you are a, a digital influencer, uh, which is a term I know you don't feel that comfortable <laughs> with. But yeah. Nonetheless, it's yours. You're an influencer. You're an author. You're a blogger. You're a keynote speaker. Yeah. You, you you do a lot of communicating. And when you do so, who's the audience that you have in mind generally? Like, who's your target audience? Who are you trying to reach with your message? Um, anyone will listen, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I don't really think of it as an audience and more. I mean, this sounds massively pretentious, but I think of it more as like a community. Um, like my distaste for the word influencer comes from many different angles. You know, one is this idea that there are some people who are influential and other people who are not, I think is nonsense. Um, two, I don't think I am particularly influential. Like I think, um, you know, I'm not a teacher that knows all the stuff and then these sort of five and six year olds sit in the class and, you know, there's the, the objective truth that I have and people sit there and listen and learn, you know, this is a changing world and I don't know any more than other people. You know, I, I feel a bit more like a kind of, um, I don't know, an orchestrator of parades where, you know, I might have a microphone and there might be more people that happen to listen to me. But I'm basically saying, hey, has anyone got any good views on this? Hey, what do you think about that? I'm trying to I'm trying to create a conversation about these interesting changes that are happening to the world. And I like to think of myself more as a sort of instigator or agitator or sort of, I know, provocateur, or, or something like that, really, more than more than anything else. Um, the people I hope will join in this conversation, and the people I hope will join in because they hear my stuff. I think they're from a variety of industries, really. Like my my kind of career is in advertising, um, but it's it's more about I don't know, like anyone in business who has an interesting point of view or interesting perspective. So maybe they're a chief. Um, information officer, maybe they're a chief digital officer, maybe they're the CEO, maybe they're a CMO, uh, maybe they're someone that works in the storefront and they actually get to meet customers on a daily basis. Like anyone that has a sort of, um, I mean, insight is an overused word, but anyone that's got something particularly interesting to offer. And how did this all start? How did you start um, getting so many followers? And was it just you ranting on Twitter and LinkedIn and eventually <laughs> people started it following? Is- yeah, I was just in a cupboard wearing white underwear, sweating, being angry on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Um, it definitely wasn't a plan. I mean, I think I think now that you know these influences are people that appear to have careers. I think there is this sense that there are people setting out to do this, and they can make a lot of money from doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm definitely not smart or strategic enough for that to be my plan. Um, quite honestly, and I've said this a bit before, but I was working in advertising for quite a long time. I got really, really excited about how technology could make amazing things possible. I got really annoyed that advertising agencies were really smug and sort of saying, oh, look at Blockbusters. They went out of business for not changing. Look at Nokia. Look how stupid they were for not changing. And then as an industry, we weren't really changing at all. So I became quite sort of vocal and then that didn't really help my career because I kind of got fired Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, and then I just got a bit depressed and I sort of realized that I thought that maybe I had interesting things to say and maybe I should write things Um, I started using this website called Quora I guess about seven years ago and I I think I sort of um, I answered quite a lot of questions on there and my work seemed to do quite well and then I don't know like um my sort of girlfriend at the time was working in sort of PR and she was like, look, I think you've got something really interesting to say. I think we can probably 
you know, get you published in a few places. So I then thought, great, I'm going to write to the New York Times and get a little column going, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to work for Time Magazine or The Economist. Um, and then she told me that it wasn't really that easy, and I should probably start out, you know, working for, you know, tiny little niche publications. That Blogging had, on like, Medium or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, um, I mean, I won't mention their names, but there's a sort of hierarchy, I guess, of advertising publications, and there are some that maybe have ten thousand followers on Twitter, and there are some that will let anyone write for them. So I kind of, I started working, for, uh, you know, writing a few pieces for smaller places, and. Um, you know, again, this sounds quite smug, but the the kind of quote unquote secret to my success, I think, was that because it was just me and I was quite frustrated and I didn't have a kind of corporate PR department to go through, I was able just to write what I thought. So, you know, if I thought that British Airways were an absolutely dreadful airline, I could put that in a piece without anyone worrying that that means that we can't pitch their business for 10 years. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. so, yeah so the only real advantage I had was that I, I had this unique combination of actually being able to get published and actually being able to have an opinion. And I think, to be honest, it's those two things that are the only real thing I've got. No, it's, it's interesting. And, and I came from the WPP world originally and spent yeah. most of my time there until just recently. Uh, so yeah. I, I wonder, too, as you're, as you're out talking uh, about these issues, and you seem quite passionate about some of these things, if you, if you read some of the things that you, that you talk about, you challenge a lot of the traditional conventions and, you know, the way people are using data and the way people are thinking about brands. What I wanted to talk a little bit about today, uh, Tom, was about solutions and what companies could be doing, what they should be thinking about from the conversations that you've had, the brands that you've worked with, you know, where we can start to talk about, well, how do we fix it? Like, what are the things that we really need to get our house in order and, and start to change and adapt to what's been happening? And I'd love to talk a little bit about that yeah, today, yeah. you know? No, absolutely. I mean, I am I really welcome this type of conversation because I am massively aware that I've managed to have a nice few years going around speaking on stages saying, hey, we can do amazing stuff. Hey, everything can be better. But I'm starting to feel quite vulnerable about the fact that, you know, as much as I'm joking about being an angry guy on the internet, like it, it is quite easy to sort of perceive me as being someone that maybe asks good questions you know, maybe says interesting things, but then proceeds to do absolutely nothing about it. And it, it's increasingly important for me to be someone that actually makes a difference rather than asks questions. But I would say it's really hard. I mean, the, the reason why I default to writing articles rather than default to announcing projects that I've made happen is that I'm staggered at how difficult it is to make companies change. Yeah, we agree. We agree. We've been <laughs> Mary and I've been doing the podcast for quite some time, and it's it's been fascinating. Yeah. Actually, how many issues that still exist and have been going on for decades, and we seem to be talking about the same bloody things, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of action sometimes. You know? Yeah, it's this weird thing where um, you know, there are moments where it feels like technology is making sweeping changes and that everything is faster than ever before. And I think sometimes we sort of forget that if we actually look out around the world, there are some companies that seem quite surprised that buying things from the internet is a big thing. You know, like they, they appear to sort of taken them, you know, from from behind. Um, you know, there are some companies that have absolutely dreadful mobile app experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's it's as if somehow, you know, people think that we've understood more than we have. And, and we're sort of obsessed with somehow, you know, what can we do about artificial intelligence or what can we do about blockchain or what can we do about virtual reality? Like, I'd quite like to be able to send people an email or, you know, I'd quite like them to have sort of opening hours that are reflective of the fact that people tend to sort of work different hours these days. You know, so often we sort of overthink these things and we haven't really got to grips with the basic yet. Yeah. Well, I, I think one of the things you said just in the last day or two, which really struck me was the more senior you get in an organization, the further you're getting away from your customers. <laughs> yeah. And we've heard that several times. Yeah. I wonder your thoughts on that. Do you think this is, is one of the reasons why some companies just aren't able to pivot to where their customers are going? Because the people at the top that control the budgets and, and make the decisions for the organization aren't as tuned in to what their customers need, want, expect? I think I think we need to explore this a lot further. I think um, my my main sort of hypothesis, and it came out a bit in a book I wrote, was that you know when when technology arrives, what tends to happen? I mean, it happened with electricity, it happened with steam power, like it probably happened with the wheel for all I know. Like we tend to sort of take the things that we've always done 
and we sort of layer in this new technology around the edge of it. So we tend to kind of form, you know, contemporary versions of something that's old. That actually, if we were to draw a line underneath it, we wouldn't have invented that thing in the first place. Right. You know, so there are good sort of examples of this where you get sort of electronic PDF versions of magazines or something. And you're like, no, the whole point about digital technology and digital screens is it doesn't have to be a PDF and it can hyperlink. And we have things like, you know, electronic tickets where you go to events and you can now scan a ticket on the way in. Like these are kind of both literal examples, but also sort of metaphors of how we tend to kind of um, contemporize the old rather than the rebuilding. And I think that's a sort of key part of it, where for companies to actually really, really establish themselves around the potential of these new technologies, they need to make really significant changes. They need to really, really rewire the very foundation of their companies. And most people at a certain level of seniority, you know, like they've got like a mortgage on a house and they're worried about what school their kids are going to go to next and how much that's going to cost in school fees. Like they're not really prepared to undertake the risk and to do something that's going to take a long time to pay off. So instead, they tend to do a lot of sort of distractions. So they'll kind of like create a kind of VR app or they'll do a trade show where you can kind of, I don't know, like uh, win something with a QR code or something. Everything's very gestural. I think these people tend to kind of, I don't, know, I don't know whether they're in denial or whether it's a very sort of basic human reaction to all this, but I think I think the more they realize about how much they should be doing, the more uncomfortable they feel. Right. I think they almost deliberately isolate themselves away from the real cliff face where it all happens. And I'm not being, I'm not being sort of critical. Like I'm sure in, in 10 years time, I'll be doing the same. Um, like it's a very human thing to want to have a comfortable life and to not, you know, to be able to sleep at night and stuff. But it's something I'm a parent of. So, you know, many, many companies are built with terrible, terrible software that massively wastes productivity. And they have, you know, everything from cultures to working processes to policies, which are all um, not particularly effective for the modern world. And what we tend to see is it's the, these companies that build themselves for today that are the ones that are really thriving. It's interesting. Is that like two step forward, one step back, maybe where we advance in a certain department, but in the other, we're still stuck to our old ways. We tend to address this a lot. Going back to what you said at the beginning, uh, it's uh, like with uh, digital surveys, for instance, most of the digital surveys out there, instead of being entirely new, are just a digital version of the pen and paper surveys from the 1920s. It's exactly the same thing. Nothing has changed. Why do you, why do you think that we get stuck other than then safety and comfort is, do you think there's a, a, another more powerful reason or is it just humans getting stuck in a rut and refusing to change <laughs> because we're comfortable? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that probably is it. I mean, there, there'd be other things that manifest itself themselves as a result of that sort of primary primal human condition of not wanting to change. But I mean, we're very good at seeing patterns and we're very good at repeating those patterns. Like I think, we find it extremely difficult to sort of break out of cycles because, I mean, like, you know, if you, if you imagine these surveys, they've, we've probably been measuring things which are very easy to measure. We've probably been measuring things that we've been tracking for a long time. We probably have got quite a lot of, you know, analysis that we've used to establish what those metrics mean and what that'll mean for productivity or profitability or whatever. So to sort of come along and say, well, you've been measuring this and that and you've been measuring it in this way, that's actually a complete waste of time and we need to completely rethink it. It's highly sort of disruptive. And while it might be a better way to do things, I, I don't think many people are prepared to take that huge leap that we need to. Like if you look at lots and lots of things that exist in the modern world, there are lots and lots of systems that we'd never create today. But to be the person that sort of changes it all is so monumentally difficult that most people decide just to sort of carry on within the current paradigm in a way. Worthix is disrupting the market research industry with cutting edge technology and a revolutionary methodology. Visit worthix.com to learn how we're using artificial intelligence to improve customer experience at companies like Verizon, Jeep, Blizzard, HP, and L'Oreal. Well, talking about data and surveys, you spoke a bit about this in the article that you wrote for Marketing Weekly. Yeah. And we spoke to someone recently, and, and the idea is there's no lack of data. There's a ton of data, right? It's, it's all over the place. Yeah. You have data from surveys, but you also have data from 
social media and you have it from reviews and you have it from people just, you know, customers actually complaining at the front desk. Um, so if we were able, let's imagine we were able to amass all of that data and gather it all in, in the most productive way possible, which is a whole other um, can of worms. But if we were able to do that and get all that information and all that data, what do we do with it? What do you think is the best thing to do with it? I'm, I'm a big fan of, of being um, potentially wrong, but perhaps starting an interesting conversation by being wrong. Um, so I feel vulnerable in saying this, but I don't think we actually need anything like as much data as current or prevailing wisdom um, assumes. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you um, run an airline, you know, to do like a focus group a couple of times a month with your highest value customers, to do some with people that very rarely fly with you, to do some with someone that works for, you know, that normally flies with your rival the amount of data that you get from that is incredible. You know, you could then look at other data, like, you know, on time arrivals, you know, how long people are waiting at a gate on average. Like, you, we can probably build up a picture with remarkably little data. But we've got this obsession somehow that because we can send out a survey free of charge every time someone flies, the, the kind of cost of that is zero. And actually, the cost of doing that is quite significant. Like, you know, I fly an extraordinary amount with one airline. And every time they write to me, they'll use things like, how was your trip to Chicago? It's like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, at least change the sort of tonality of the way you're expressing this to be like, wow, I can't believe you went to Chicago again. Um, <laughs> you know, there, there just seems to be very, very little empathy and very, very little thought behind most of this stuff. And you get the feeling that companies just want to gather as much and as much and as much information without a real clarity behind why they're gathering it. Um, I mean, it's kind of one of my um, sort of tweets that I quite like, but I, I feel like we celebrate big data when in fact we should be celebrating big decisions that we make because it's actually, you know, the reason we need decisions is not is is kind of to understand things, but it's actually to sort of make decisions about that understanding. Um, and I see more data than I've ever seen before, and I see more people proud of the size of the data they capture and how quickly they capture it. And I see very, very few examples of anyone actually doing anything meaningful with it. Yeah. Almost reminds me, Tom, of everybody talking about how many friends they had on Facebook or how many likes their picture got. I, <laughs> my data is bigger than your data, yeah. you know, kind of uh, <laughs> data going on. Yeah, I mean, but we, we get we get metrics like that. I mean, working in advertising, we have all these award ceremonies where people get to sort of boast about how successful their campaign was. And they always celebrate things like, well, you know. 37 million people watched the video or the, you know, yeah, yeah. like retweet increased by 3000%. It's like, who cares? Like, you know, can you pay your rent with a view of a video? Like, can you, can you take the number of friends that you have to your boss and get a promotion because of it? No, like none of this stuff matters. No, I, I get you. I've, I've judged for the FEs several times over the years. And I always liked the FEs because it was about effectiveness. We were always trying to look at, was it really a business impact? Not just, you know, we got some, with superfluous uh, measures. Um, what I wanted to ask you re re related to this, Tom, was so. So I think we agree with you, and and there is there are a lot of challenges here. I I'd love you to, if you can, if there's something that you can share around some companies that you think have really done a nice job. Uh, either if it's it's the way leadership has sort of set the culture, if it's the way a company has has really maybe even from your personal experience delivered an amazing experience. I'd love to hear if you have a few examples you could share so the listeners could get some ideas and maybe, you know, uh, for companies that you've seen do it right. Yeah, I mean, there aren't as many examples as I would love to give because I think maybe we're, I think this stuff takes so long to do that maybe the next few years will be good examples. Um, I mean, these are slightly sort of random in nature because they're just sort of coming into my head as a thought stream. I think McDonald's has done an incredible job, actually. Ah. I mean, the, the, the experience of going into most McDonald's these days is that you go in, there's a digital kiosk you can use. You can pick up a number, um, so do your order, pay with your credit card, sit down, and then someone brings you your food. Um, or you can decide to pick it up, in which case they've completely sort of re-engineered their kitchen, so there's all these um, staff that now sort of hand out orders very quickly. Um, and it's a completely different experience. Um, and it's not something that people are really talking about. No, um, not at so all. the design of the kiosk is decent. Yeah, but, the you know, like... Um, you know, digital transformation is one of these t words that people use, but it's actually sort of a an experience which has been transformed with quite rudimentary technology. But they've they've done it extremely well. 
Um, what I love is, is um, you know, technology that changes behavior for me is quite interesting. You know, Uber was always quite interesting for me because it meant that there would be hotels that I would stay in sort of near the airport in fairly random cities. But ordinarily, I never would have gone to that hotel and said, well, I feel like going to a sort of nice restaurant right now or I feel like meeting a friend because it was just impossible. As, and then now you get Uber and all of a sudden you think, oh, maybe I should go and see that person because it's going to be easy. We have airlines now that now let you sort of change your flight on the same day free of charge just by pressing a few clicks. You know, Delta and American both do this pretty well. And again, like, you know, we don't celebrate these things, but actually being able to be in a bar and just being like, oh, stuff, I'll have one more beer and move my flight back. That's a pretty amazing sort of moment. Um, you know, the classic case of this is Netflix, I think, you know, who kind of self-disrupted themselves. You know, they knew that their long-term future was not going to be in DVD uh, rentals by mail. Yeah. And they kind of knew, therefore, they would have to completely re- you know, rejig their whole company. And they did that way, way, way earlier than they had to. And then now they're seeing the rewards not of being a kind of logistics outfit that mails out DVDs, but now they're a kind of entertainment company that, monetizes our attention um so there are there are, there are a couple of interesting examples like that out there and what do you think of this um it's it's not really that recent but it seems to get be getting more focused now where companies even retail and and like product-based companies are kind of switching their gear to become a, an experience economy, which is part of the market that we're, we are in, which is customer experience. So you have stores like Nike, who now has an experience store where you can go in there and there's a, like an augmented reality thing and you can run in the forest using their sneakers, right? Or Verizon, yeah. that you go into their store and you experience the Golden Gate Bridge and flying along the Golden Gate Bridge inside a Verizon <laughs> store, right? I mean... How does how do you see this? I mean, I wrote a piece um, a while ago about how we're kind of seeing things bifurcate into sort of shopping versus buying. And buying is the sort of act of obtaining things without noticing it as quickly as possible, whereas shopping is about sort of enjoying the process. And I think we need to be aware that um, the creation of experience is, fan- is fantastic. And there are some times of day and there are some products that we buy and there are some use cases where we really, really want an experience. You know, shopping malls are going to be around, you know, for a long time, if not forever, you know, and people will enjoy the process. And I've, I've been to that sort of Nike store and it's quite fun. But we also need to sort of celebrate the lack of experience sometimes. Yeah. Um, we also need to sort of celebrate places that um, are not memorable, but they've still taken a lot of money out of our wallets without us really noticing. And it's it's quite hard to be profitable with experiences. Like like again, I'm a I'm a huge fan of you know the big flagship store experiences, but the reality is that you're not going to be in a kind of third tier city and find a Nike you know Nike town where you can sort of like run alongside Tiger Woods at the same right. time. Well, um, we classify this and like the difference is like the the time well spent versus the time well saved. If you're looking for a, a time well spent, it's more like a, a, a leisurely experience, whereas the other is just grab it and go, right? I think sometimes marketers don't do a great job of being highly empathetic and they, they sort of like the idea of copying what other people do. Uh-huh. You know, so if you're, if you're shopping for wine, you know, wine is one of those funny things where you kind of enjoy reading a label. Mm. And, um, you know, to, to make a point rather than to be particularly serious, but if you imagine there being some sort of AR experience where you can sort of hold your phone up to a bottle of wine and, you know, some guy that picks the grapes sort of, you know, tells you like how great the harvest was that year. Like 19 I mean, I, I don't necessarily or something. want that. Remember those? <laughs> yeah. Where it's like the criminals from Australia. Yeah, they like start telling the story <laughs> about their voyage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. You can kind of you, you can see the merit in that. I'm not saying I want that, but if, if that's going to be you know published this week in Campaign Magazine as an idea, I'll take it. But then you get sort of people that make you know choc- you know big you know Mondelez or make big chocolate cookies or something, and there'll be some sort of online game that you can play. And it's like I don't know, like um, we need to be highly mindful of people and the environment they're in and and how they feel at that moment in time. And quite a lot of our life, we are just trying to get home in time and we're trying to watch the TV show that we like and we're trying to um, do homework for school or we're trying to do our part-time job at the side to make extra money. Like We just don't have time for all this stuff. No, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, I was thinking as, as we sort of wind down uh, in the podcast, Tom, uh, if you were to think about all the things that you've been talking about and writing about and blogging about, 
over the past uh, years. What would, especially focusing in on experience and customer experience, what advice would you give to the listeners out there about what, what you think are the most critical things that, that should be a priority for them to really uh, dig into? What, what's your opinion? The one or two things that you think are absolute game changers that, that companies need to get on top of and get moving on? What would you say? Um, it's quite hard to say one or two of the key things. Um, I mean, I th- w- one thing is um, there's this great expression in computer programming about how you should never ask a question that you can reasonably deduce yourself. <laughs> um, and I feel like, you know, especially sort of service industries, they, they, they tend to put quite a lot of the work onto you. So you sort of come to a hotel and it's sort of up to you. You know, you've yeah. just come from like a flight from Sydney and you sort of arrive in the hotel. You've already given them your credit card. You've already got a booking. And then they sort of walk up to you and say, you know, can I have your ID? Can I have your credit cards? You know, can you fill in this form? And it's like, you know, how do you get me to do your work for you? Um, and, I, and I mean that in all sorts of ways. So whether, whether it's like, you know, the number of times you have to fill in your name and address on the mailing list and they don't take Apple Pay and they don't pay like PayPal, so then you have to get up off of your seat and cross the room and find your credit card somewhere. Just just the idea of, of using empathy to think through every single part of a process and then think, how do we use technology either to make this easier or to make the, or remove the step altogether or just make this delightful? So as basic as it is, there's some technology to do with um, conversational forms where, you know, say like, hello, blank, you know, um, do you live in this address, blank? It starts to sort of make the process of what is effectively data entry actually feel quite nice. So I think I think the application of empathy is key. And the other thing, which is, I guess, is my second thing is technology. So it, it's all of our jobs to be aware, um, you know, to travel around or to speak to different people from around the world and just be aware of technology that's out there. So whether it is augmented reality, whether it is image recognition, whether it is uh, predictive computing, whether it is um, the growth of, um, you know, WeChat like apps in China, you know, we should just be aware of of all of the potential that these developing technologies mean for our business and then be proactively trying to sort of layer those through into solutions. It's funny that you said that when you talked about technology and, and how it can make processes easier. I remember now that I think the best thing for me about um, the new iOS and Apple is the fact that I never have to remember a password again. So it'll create some insane password that, I mean, you got to be a pretty good hacker to, to guess that. It's like EXY <laughs> and plus hashtag, that, yeah. I don't know what. And it'll save it across all of my devices and auto-populate the field every time I log in. I'm like, sold. I'm staying with Apple forever. They, they control my life. <laughs> they know they have all my passwords. I don't even know what they are. I don't choose passwords anymore. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think that that's a really good literal example, but that's also a really good um, way to sort of illuminate the point, which is actually the the goal of all technology really is to render itself invisible and in the background. You know, the, the best technology is stuff that you don't notice. It's the photograph which is which is so good that you can't sort of notice it. it's a photograph. It feels like reality. It's the sort of five G connectivity, which means you just have information everywhere, always, immediately. Um, I think often companies make the mistake that they sort of add technology, whereas actually increasingly it's about it being in the background and, and sort of invisible. And, you know, I would I would love my phone to realize that I'm walking towards the gym and then decide to automatically, you know, load up my gym uh, membership card onto the screen. Or if I'm, you know, eating food in McDonald's, it'd be quite nice if it opened up the app when I'm in McDonald's. So, so this, this way that we can use technology to be more predictive and more assistive, I think, is quite interesting. Yeah. Well, I hate to be redundant with the Apple references, but that, that, that does already happen. If you're walking in a space and there's an Apple store nearby, it'll automatically open up the Apple store app and say, welcome <laughs> to Apple. And you're like, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess it's all, it's all technologically possible. It's just it's a question of um, the politics behind these companies and also what people you know, prepared to sort of build, I guess. Yeah. Most people know how to find you, but if there is a great way for people to reach you and follow you, what's the best channel? It sort of depends on what you want. So if you want to have like about roughly one thing per day that might be quite well thought through, um, then follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm Tom F. Goodwin on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. 
but it's not even more professional, Tom. If you want to just sort of see random thoughts that I have during the day, some of which are particularly unhelpful, some of which might be quite interesting, uh, then Twitter's quite good. Um, and if you want to contact me, then email is by far the best. Like, I, I can't stand this world we have where people send you pictures on Instagram and they direct message you on Twitter. Like, email is by far the best way to get most people these days, and it's certainly the case with me. And I'm Tom F. Goodwin at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us today, Tom. Yeah, we appreciate you, Tom. your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Voices of Customer Experience. If you'd like to hear more or get a full podcast summary, visit the episode details page or go to blog.worthix.com slash podcasts. This episode of Voices of Customer Experience was hosted and produced by Mary Drummond, co-hosted by James Conrad and edited by Nick Gomez. Blog copy and summary by Emma Waldron. <laughs>